usual setting, um, uh, because of the Einstein symposium that takes place uh, in Philips. And we're actually starting on time, so that's a very good uh, um, arrangement. Uh, we're starting usually whenever the room gets filled, so um, the room is smaller than usual. So there, are, there are actually some seats still available here. Um, and we will have the other changes that we will have the ITC colloquium uh, at 3 p.m. in this room because uh, this room was taken at 11 a.m. Uh, and then um, we have some uh, interesting visitors aside from the Einstein uh, fellows, one of whom is Bob Kirchner sitting over there that uh, used to be a resident of this building uh, not so long ago and we still miss him. Uh, so we will start uh, with uh, Julian uh, Munoz. Uh, he's in the physics department, a postdoc uh, in physics, uh, with uh, Corinne Borkin, that is also here. So Thank you. Are. Here she is. Uh, and he will talk about large distance lens uh, uncertainties and time delay measurements of H0. And we will continue with uh, Mark Voigt uh, from MSU. Where is Mark? Oh, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and here we talk about uh, something that looks like a German word, meaning uh, circum galacto seismology. Yeah, we can just split it into three words, and that would be an abstract of the um, And uh, he will be followed by Sivan Ginsburg from the Hebrew University, that will talk about, he's a graduating uh, soon, is it this year? You're applying to jobs? Yeah. Okay, so that, just view him in that context. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he will talk about core power valley, the radius distribution of small planets. And finally, we'll hear from another graduating student, Shmuel Bialy from Tel Aviv University. They're all arranged here. Um, and he will talk about molecules at the epoch for immunization. So, Julian. All right, so thanks for having me. My name is Julian. I'm going to be postdoc, as Abby mentioned. I did my PhD at Johns Hopkins, working with Mark Minkowski. And I want to tell you about the last paper I wrote with them, for now. Um, so about large distance lens uncertainties and how you like measurements of H0. So let me begin with telling you how we usually measure H0. One of my favorite ways is using the CMB, where the angular structure of the CMB tells us some angle of the last patterned surface, in which we can measure the angle of the angular distance, and thus, H0. A different way is to look at the local universe, look at standard candles such as supernovae, type 1A, and the luminosity, you measure some flux, you get luminosity distance, and there you get H0. You can ask Adam Rees at Hopkins all about how to calibrate this uh, distance ladder. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and when you compare the H0 measurements, it turns out that the CMB measures H0 of 67, supernovae around 73. And these two Values are three sigma tension. If history is to be learned from, last time this happened, between 50 and 100 worked out to be in between. Uh, but uh, some people say there might be new physics happening. So the CMB distance is measured for much larger redshift for supernovae in the local universe. There could be something going on. Uh, but I think before we jump into any conclusions, it'd be good to have a third independent measurement to see if this discrepancy is systematics or physics. So let me tell you about how. You can measure each knot with strong lens. And this is a very rich field with a large history going from the 60s when Rechtel first proposed it, to the 80s when the first measurement of a strong delay of a time delay strong lens quasar, which is this one, P0957, was uh, measured. And we now have a wealth of understanding and data, which hopefully will lead us to, to present level precision measurements in each knot. So, what is the basic idea? If you've never heard of this, imagine you have a lens and has a mass distribution where the density is something like isothermal, goes R to the minus 2. In this case, a convergence is just some theta Einstein divided by the angle of theta. <coughs> theta Einstein roughly gives you the idea of the strength of the lens related to the mass. So you have a source, that's like impact parameter beta. If it's stronger lens, you will kind of serve two images, an angle of theta 1, theta 2. And in this toy model, you can actually, from the two angles, you can measure the impact parameter and the Einstein angle. And then the time delay tells you a distance, this time delay distance, which is related to H0. <coughs> so therefore, measuring theta 1, theta 2, 
tabulae, you can actually obtain information about the lens and also H0. This is a very simple case, but in reality, it's not that far. Um, the Holy Cow collaboration, which Holy Cow stands for H0 Lenses in Cosmogray of Wellness, <laughs> they, they, they made it work, um, <laughs> use the power law distribution on the, so it's instead of R minus 2, it's R minus gamma prime. Gamma prime is close to 2, depends on the lens. And then the convergence is also a power law. And using this model with electricity, uh, they use three quad systems, which are these three to measure each knot of around 72 with around 4% error bars. This value is closer to the supernova than to the CMB. Uh, but there's only three systems. We have two more that they're, they're going to analyze soon and report. And the whole Cosmic Rail has been monitoring 20 strongly lensed quasars. Once the 20 are analyzed, it's expected that they're going to reach percent level precision on each knot. So now we have to worry about every single systematic and bias that can remain on the data. What I'm going to tell you about is how the long distance behavior of less models can affect your measurements of the 1% level. <clears throat> to illustrate how this works, you can see this power law distribution is clearly in physical long distances. Galaxies have to end at some finite region, especially if you use isothermal, you have infinite mass. So you can just truncate it by adding a heavy side theta function, and the details of the truncation are not very important. You can just have a uh, little kink, so you go to an NFW, R2 minus 3. Uh, but if you subtract it, your convergence will be a rescaled version of the old one, plus this kappa sub t term. So for example, for isothermal, this kappa sub t works out to be minus Einstein radius divided by pi truncation radius. There's different forms for different gamma primes, but in all cases, it's a constant. The fact that it's a constant convergence makes it invisible to strong lenses. This is because of mass shift degeneracy. So let me briefly tell you about this mass shift degeneracy. At first I told you that if you measure theta 1 and theta 2, you will know everything about the lens. But a lie. In reality, you can rescale the impact parameter, which is invisible. It's unobservable to begin with. If you also rescale your lens model with this lambda and add a constant. It's equivalent of taking some mass away from your lens, putting in a constant sheet, and then you rescale the impact parameter. Then your images will not change positions. They'll be in the same place. So these are observable in the images. By the time delay changes, and thus your h not measurement changes, because you're taking mass away from the lens. Uh, this is not just a theoretical curiosity. It's expected the mass along the line of sight causes convergence and deconvergence of light rays, which causes an external convergence of the measured, um, of the measured lens quasars. This is an example from one of the Cherry Studios that he had a polycap. This is a uh, source at Reshi 1.39, and you see this is a very wide PDF for the external convergence. And in fact, the width of this, of this, PD, this PDF is one of the main limiting factors of contemporary measurements of H0. And the hope is that measuring many systems would bring down this width over, you know, just for the fan. But also, it's hoped that the average of this, of this many PDFs or many lines of sight is zero. Since an FRW universe, over densities and under densities tend to average out. It's been recently pointed out by uh, Colin and Cunnington that the fact that we're serving strongly lens quasars, or quadruple lens, these guys tend to live in over dense lines of sight on average. So this causes slight bias on their external convergence, and thus, a slight bias on each nut is not accounted for. So these quasars tend to live in over these regions. They have to encounter strong lens galaxy. So there's more matter than average whenever you see one of these guys, by around 1%. Similarly, I've told you before that a realistic lens has to be truncated. If you choose not to truncate your lenses, you're choosing to apply a massive transformation with this parameter kappa sub t. So you're biasing your h not measurements by this amount kappa sub t. To find the size of this, uh, we need to know what the truncation radius is. And of course, as I said, from strong lensing, we cannot measure this. You can transform it away. But thankfully, we have weak lens measurements at large distances, uh, where you can see galaxy galaxy lensing. And different studies have been able to look at this parameter and constrain it to be around 300 <coughs> kiloparsec. And for an is here, because this is for red, very type galaxies, which tend to be lenses. But of course, blue galaxies have a very different RT, factor of two or three smaller. And ideally, we'd like to know what the RT is for lens galaxies. 
not for red, which tend to be lenses. But this gives us an idea of what the uh, size of this effect is, which had to be 1% for, for these values. So we would underestimate each knot if we don't, like, if we don't truncate our lenses at a physical distance. Uh, and I want to point out that this is a bias. This doesn't average out, as I said, over many lenses. It goes in the same direction for all of them. But once you subtract it, you're left with a little bit of an error, right? Since this distribution of capital T's will have some width. Now, if you assume the width is comparable to the magnitude, this is 1%, as long as you have enough lenses, this will hopefully be sub percent and can be ignored. But this also is something that uh, should be in their, in their budget. So, to sum up, I've told you how there's been tremendous progress in the field of measurement of H naught with tangible lensing, and it seems that percent level measurements are possible. Uh, at this point, we have to worry about a lot of little biases, and I've told you about one of them arising from the log distance less mass. And I've told you how to how to use weak lensing data to remove these bias. And hopefully, studies on all this will leave us with a percent level measurement of H naught, which will tell us whether the CME is right, supernova right, or they are both right, but there's some exciting new physics. Thanks. Another possible systematic bias is due to uh, the curial velocities that change the redshift that you assign to the lens or the source. Is that much smaller? I think so, because all the lenses are redshift point fifty something, okay, so forty-five or so. so small I think, correction. I think it's a very small correction. Less than <coughs> yeah. Erwin, yeah. how are you going to establish with this <laughs> That's a good question. If this agreed with the supernova and didn't agree with the CMB, then there's no way to tell, right? This is this is a local measurement of the redshift. If this agree with the CMB, then the supernova are wrong. So we cannot test all the hypothesis space, but we can test whether the supernova are right, which I think is important. But it's also possible both are right and it's a function of redshift. Yeah, so yeah, yeah there's That's no way the to correct for that. Yeah. Well, I mean this is slightly higher redshift than supernova, I think, because all the lenses are 0.5. To 0.5 to 1, slightly far, but it's not far enough to, to test the evolution. That's right. Other comments or questions? Well, don't you expect the real dark matter distribution is more ragged than uh, your model, and so not symmetric in, in the way it's in? You mean ragged like it's not a power law? Or? Yeah, no, it's not, not absolutely uh, symmetric. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. In principle, so you've got one that truncated. Yes. That sounds right. But it's also going to be clumpy in some way that people in this room probably computed for a particular involvement. So it's interesting that power law models seem to fit most of the lenses very well, and that seems like a coincidence. But it can recently pointed out that choosing power laws in some way, it, you, can, you can mimic, you know, with the strong lensing, you only measure things around the extinct radius. So any profile around here, you can make it mimic a power law to a massive transformation. So actually choosing power loss is in some way imposing an additional massive transformation if the profile is ragged or has some something going on. But one should keep in mind that uh, we're talking about the percent level and the variance make 10% or more you know, of the mass in galaxies. So um, the issue is, I mean, that initially the variance make up up to 20%. Uh, and then if the virus do something unusual at the level of 1%, then it would not be captured by end body simulations. So the, the, hope, the hope, I think, is using actual thing, something that resembles like an end body simulation putting it in your model. But there's not enough data points, not data for each lens to actually fit all the parameters that can go with this. So the hope is that power loss are good on average for the lenses. But that's also, people are studying the systematic any other comments? If not, let's thank uh, Julia again.
All right, circumglycosis. So I'm not currently looking for a job, but I'm willing to listen. <laughs> uh, so this is the first slide of the talk I'm going to give in an hour, uh, three hours, two and a half hours. Uh, but I'm going to say something different about it. And interesting, uh, Adi referred to the fact that maybe baryons around galaxies are doing something interesting. I think they are. Um, this is NGC 1275, the central galaxy of the Perseus cluster. And what you can see around it is a lot of multi-phase gas. And I think one of the trends in galaxy evolution is that the baryons around the galaxy may have a lot to do with galaxy evolution. It's where most of the baryons are, and whether or not they're condensing or blowing out or whatever has a lot to do with the galaxy. But often you can't see the hot phase. And in a uh, X-ray image you can. This is a digital unsharp mass image uh, done by Jeremy Sanders group. The filtering is producing small scale structure that's not real, but the large scale structure is. And what you can see is a lot of interesting variations in brightness. They're indicating density differences and perhaps some temperature differences in the galactic atmosphere around this object. And so you can't do this for low mass galaxies, but if you want to learn how the circumlighting medium works, these X-ray images are very helpful. And the physics we learn here might tell us a lot about the physics in smaller scale systems. Can you tell us how big that scale is? Uh, this scale is about 10 kiloparsecs. Up to that, from center of the earth. Yeah. So up, up to that up. one. So yeah. that would be, okay. So this is about 100 kiloparsecs are, are out here. Okay. Um, so uh, what kind of waves are there? Um, one great visualization of them it was done by Eugene Chirazov uh, last year. And this is the center of the Perseus cluster. And what he's done is, this is a soft band map, and this is a hard band map. <coughs> and the, the, there's the, the radial, smooth radial structure has been subtracted, so you see the azimuthal stuff. And you can see structures that look somewhat different in the soft band and the hard band. Now if you ask, you know, how does the integral along the line of slate change? If you're saying, what's the, um, the difference divided by the mean, you get something that includes temp density differences and temperature differences. And if the temperature dependence of brightness is different in the soft band and the hard band, uh, you can make this into a uh, system of two equations for unknowns and separate out the density fluctuations and the temperature fluctuations. So for example, if I just straight subtract these images, I can isolate what the temperature fluctuations are like. And if you then subtract them, well, the bubbles vanish, not because the rise of thermal, but because you're, you're uh, just getting, um, all this is creating is a density difference. You're kind of removing flux from there. The point I want to make is not about this, but about uh, what the important modes are. Because if, if you have two, in third analysis, you have a two state variables, you can get the rest. It's common to think of things in terms of density and temperature, but if you think about dynamics, it's pressure and entropy that are more fundamental. Because if I have a pressure difference from place to place, I'm out of high strength equilibrium, and that would get adjusted. And if I am, uh, have a, a specific entry distribution or difference from place to place, then there's a convective instability that will get rearranged. And it's these things, difference in pressure, that correspond to P modes. And differences in entropy uh, actually correspond to internal gravity waves. If you have a stratified medium and you kick it, the internal gravity wave is driven by the differences in entropy. So, if we then take this and make a linear combination that is the pressure modes, then uh, what's vanishing here are the gravity waves, and you can see some pressure differences, but you can also see it's the minority of what's in here. Okay? So this is, these are the, the sound waves that are propagating, uh, and these, are the gravity waves. This is sometimes referred to as sloshing, but really sloshing is nothing other than disturbing a system that has entropy stratification so that you're setting up gravity waves in the system. Okay. Now the reason I bother pointing this out is because it's of great interest to understand when you get condensation around a galaxy for understanding why you have multi-phase circumlactic gas, how that might fuel activity in the galaxy. And so uh, in trying to understand this link recently, uh, I, I, I tried to make it as simple as possible. And this paper was submitted Friday to AppJ. It's not on AstroPH yet, so you know, you're getting a special preview. <laughs> um, 
And the idea is, if I have an entropy stratified medium, so this is entropy rising out with radius, uh, and I just give a piece of it a kick, uh, heating and cooling are in balance in this. So if I bump something outward, it's all of a sudden lower entropy in its surroundings, and that tends to enhance cooling. So it will tend to go down in entropy. But also, it'll be negatively buoyant, and it'll tend to sink. And so, at the time scale in which it moves this direction is related to the cooling time, and the time scale in which it moves this direction is related to the freefall time. And these different colors are tracks for different ratios of pulling down to freefall time. Uh, and it has been known since 1970 that these waves are thermally unstable. In other words, if you give it a kick in a medium like this, uh, you'll go outward and overshoot when you come back. And on each of these orbits, you spend a little time uh, with, above the midpoint with, higher, with positive buoyancy and some time below the midpoint with negative buoyancy. And so the oscillations will tend to get bigger. Okay. And what happens then has been a very confusing trip through the literature for decades. Uh, but what happens is uh, eventually these waves will damp because they start shedding kinetic energy to their surroundings faster than you're pumping them thermally. And so gravity modes will tend to saturate. Uh, and they'll saturate at an amplitude that depends on this ratio. Um, and uh, a damping mode actually turns out to be nonlinear coupling to pairs of acoustic waves that have the same beat frequency as the gravity wave. The point I wanted to make is what happens now if you drive the oscillator? Okay. So now this is an oscillator set up the same way where if I give something an outward kick, it'll decline a bit in energy B and it'll come back down. And if I don't give it a big enough kick, it goes back to being a damped gravity wave mode. But if I give it a strong enough kick, it can become an overdamped harmonic oscillator. And when that happens, you get condensation. Essentially, you've taken this thing that has a certain cooling time to freefall time ratio, which in this case is five. If you get it out far enough, uh, it can cool before it falls back down. And so that means if you take the medium around a galaxy, if it's stable, uh, but you start kicking it, you can send it over into condensation. Um, and you can calculate <laughs> In the simple oscillator, how what, what it would take to do that? Um, the interesting thing then comes in when you bring in turbulence, and so this is now doing a simple oscillator model where you hook up a noise term and create a Langevin equation that's essentially saying if I have a blob that's getting kicked in momentum, how is it diffused in this plane? And if there's just a little bit of noise, you diffuse around the limit cycle. But as you turn up the uh, the noise. Uh, you start to have bigger excursions. And there's a noise level at which you drive the system into condensation. So essentially, you have a distribution function here where if the tail goes over the edge, you now have a condensing system. Uh, this means that uh, there's a link between the cooling time to freefall time ratio and the turbulence. And so I'll be going on at great length uh, in a few hours about the significance of the cooling time to freefall time ratio to whether a system can condense or not. And until recently, I would have said, it looks like there's a threshold around 10. But I now think it's coupled to the turbulence in a very interesting way. In other words, if the system is very quiescent, it can withstand a lower cooling time without going multi-phase. But if you kick it, you'll then all of a sudden start making multi-phase gas because you will start to um, eliminate the, the buoyant suppression of, uh, of condensation. So what that implies now is uh, if you then say, uh, let's imagine a system where uh, feedback can either raise the cooling time and cooling, time, cooling lowers the cooling time. And I can also uh, now have feedback affect the amount of turbulences in the medium. You can put together another dynamical oscillator equation that tells you how that system evolves through time. Because what happens is that if you don't have any condensation, then there's not much fuel for feedback. But you can get to a point where you, when you start feedback and generate turbulence, it now makes a bunch of fuel. Uh, if you make too much fuel, you'll create too much turbulence, and you'll overshoot. Um, and this system 
has potential to converge to world like world likely equilibrium state because of the coupling between turbulence and condensation through this gravity wave. Um, last statement. Uh, this may also be what mergers do. If you have a merger, you can stimulate a lot of turns that can also add fuel to the merger if a certain lack of medium is regulated in this way. The end. So Mark, the, the elephant in this room is yes. uh, the AGN in the right. middle. Um, how, how do you consider that in this picture? Uh, or is it like, um, depending on how much fuel you supply to it, right. assume some perspective? Uh, what, I, yeah, what I will be talking about this afternoon is how the AGN actually is coupled. Uh, and the argument I'm making is there's a lot of evidence accumulating that the, the AGN keeps the system hovering at this transition point. That it's actually, it, it's keeping the thing from completing a phase transition to cold gas, and that it self-regulates because of that. Uh, so this piece of the puzzle is saying, well, what determines that regulation point? Because when I talk this afternoon, I won't be going into all this. <laughs> but uh, it, it looks, uh, I'll be showing more of the observational motivation that the AGN is throttled by the transition to condensation. Uh, and you'll have to Interesting. Comments, Mark? Questions? Looks like everything was clear. Oh, great. Uh, or people are waiting to hear more details. Thank you. Yes, please. Three please return in two yes. hours and five minutes. Three 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 um, let's thank Mark again. <laughs> Before the next speaker hooks up, I just wanted to mention that on Monday at 10 a.m. we have uh, a broadcast of the press conference from NASA and that we all anticipate will announce the merger of two neutron stars followed by the electromagnetic counterparts. And the reason we want to watch it is to see the details because electromagnetism offers a rich variety of possibilities. We want to see exactly what was observed. That will be reported at 10 a.m. in Phillips Auditorium if anyone wants to see it. Uh, so, uh, hi, uh, I'm Sivan Ginsbol. I'm a student of uh, Lamb Sally from Jerusalem. And I'll talk about uh, the very in the largest distribution of small exoplanets. And this is the work done together with uh, Hilke Schlifting from uh, UCLA. So, the largest uncertainty in uh, uh, characterizing a planet's radius is uh, knowing the radius of its uh, host star. So recently, the California Capital Survey refined our estimates uh, of the radius of over uh, 1,000 stars. And that allowed them to get this sample of uh, planets with relatively precisely measured uh, radius. Uh, so here, this is the distribution uh, they got uh, a few months ago. So this is the number of planets uh, as a function of the planet's uh, radius and the units of the uh, radius of Earth. So first of all, you can see that most of these capital planets are relatively small, a few times the radius of Earth. We already knew that. The new thing is that now you can see this distinct value in the distribution. You can see that planets that are roughly twice the size of the Earth are significantly less common than both somewhat smaller and somewhat uh, larger planets. And uh, one way to interpret this is that the left peak is composed of uh, rocky planets. Well, as the light peak is composed of very similar rocky planets, or now rocky cones, engulfed by these gas atmospheres that roughly double uh, the radius. And now, this interpretation is possible because for a subset of these planets, we also have mass measurements. And from the combined mass and gravity, uh, we know the density. And uh, the, some of these planets have low densities that are consistent uh, with this story. Um, now, in this interpretation, the question is, of course, uh, why don't we see intermediate sized atmosphere? What happened to them? So the standard story is that such atmospheres are susceptible to photo evaporation, uh, to high energy irradiation coming from the host star. And there's a very nice recent paper by Owen and Moon that explains this uh, mechanism very intuitively. Uh, but here I will suggest uh, a different mechanism. So here I'm suggesting that these atmospheres are evaporated not due to some photons coming from the whole star, but rather due to the uh, luminosity coming from the cooling core uh, of the planet itself. Uh, so to see how it works, let's uh, talk a bit about how these planets and the rocky cores cool. So here we have a schematic plot of a planet. Here we have a rocky core with radius uh, Rc. And on top we have the gas atmosphere. 
So most of the atmosphere is convective, but on top it has this radiative outer envelope, uh, and this serves uh, as a bottleneck or as a lid that uh, determines the cooling rate. Uh, so in such a structure, you can use the hydrostatic equilibrium equation and calculate the temperature profile all the way down the atmosphere until you get the temperature at the bottom of the atmosphere. And this is also the temperature uh, of the rocky ball, and you get this expression. So you can see that as long as the atmosphere is very thick, as long as this delta R is much larger than the radius of the core, then the core's temperature is fixed. It is simply this virial temperature, so the core can't cool. Only when the uh, atmosphere gets thin, only when its thickness delta R becomes comparable to the radius of the core, uh, only then can the temperature of the core decrease and the core can start uh, cooling. So in this thin atmosphere regime, we can write down the uh, energy of the heat capacity of the cooling planet. So we have this term, which is due to the uh, thermal and gravitational energy of the atmosphere. And now we also have this term, which is the thermal energy of the rocky core simply by substituting this temperature. And you can see that we have here the ratio of the molecular weights of the atmosphere to that of the gas, because what determines the heat capacity is the number of particles. So this is the cooling energy, and now we can compare it to the energy needed to unbind uh, the atmosphere. And you can see that uh, we have uh, two regimes. So we can see that uh, if the atmosphere is massive, uh, if this term dominates, then uh, the planet doesn't have enough energy to unbind its own atmosphere. So massive atmospheres survive. But if the atmosphere is light, lighter than uh, this ratio, then this core term dominates. And you can easily see that uh, the core's luminosity is enough to unbind the atmosphere in this sort of uh, runaway evaporation process. Because the more atmosphere you lose, the easier it's to lose the rest of the atmosphere, because you need less energy to unbind it. Uh, so, this is why planets are driven to being uh, either roughly twice the radius of the core, when they have massive atmospheres that roughly double the radius, or being just the radius of the core because they've lost uh, all of their atmosphere. Uh, and we expect to find the gap between these two values. And I'm claiming that this gap uh, is exactly the value that we see in the distribution. Uh, so this is the intuitive idea, but now we want to do this more quantitatively. So we want to simulate the population of planets uh, and let them evolve for a few gigaels and check their distribution. So first we need to know how to distribute the planets. So uh, first of all, for all of these planets, we know their periods, so we know their distances from the star, so we know their uh, equilibrium temperatures. So this one is easy. Uh, next, for a subset of these planets, uh, we know their masses, so we know the mass distribution. What we don't know is the initial uh, distribution of atmosphere, of initial atmosphere masses. So this one we have to take from theoretical atmosphere accretion models. So anyway, we have a population of planets, and then we uh, let them run, both cool and lose mass for three gigaels. Uh, and these are the results. So the gray histogram is the, is the observations. This is the same one that we had on the first time. So first, let's look at the top red model. This is when we allow the planets to cool, but we shut off artificially the mass loss. Uh, so they keep the mass. And we see that we can reduce only the light peak because atmospheres keep uh, their mass. When we allow for uh, mass loss due to the cooling of the rocky core, then we get this bottom green model. And you can see that we get both peaks. We get both the light peak, which is planets that keep their atmospheres, and the left peak, which is planets that uh, lost the atmospheres. Uh, so you can see that we can quite easily, we didn't have to twin hand parameters here, so we can quite easily uh, reduce the observed uh, distribution uh, without invoking some uh, external uh, irradiation source. Okay, so it seems that we have two theories to explain why we don't have these intermediate atmospheres. So they evaporated either to uh, core cooling, as I suggest, or photoevaporation, which is the standard explanation. Now, you must be asking how do you distinguish between the two models? And the answer is that it's difficult, and let me try to explain why. So here we have uh, a plot of the planet's uh, mass versus its equilibrium temperature, which basically measures the distance from the star. So both theories, which are these lines, these black lines, uh, predict that planets that are uh, uh, massive or cold, meaning above the light, uh, are expected to keep an atmosphere. Whereas planets that are uh, hot or light, meaning here, are expected to lose their atmospheres. And you can see that the observations uh, are more or less consistent with, uh, with this. 
So here, all of these symbols are the subset of planets for which we have both the mass and the radius. So we know the density. We know if they have an atmosphere uh, or not. And all these uh, colored squares and triangles are planets with significant atmospheres. And you can see that we can find this only above the lines. Whereas below the lines, we find only these uh, blue dots, which are planets without atmospheres. But as you can see, both lines are quantitatively and qualitatively quite uh, similar. So it will be very hard to distinguish between the two theories just based on uh, plots like this. Uh, okay, so I'll say something about it, but first let's summarize the talk. So we've seen that there's a significant uh, value in the largest distribution of uh, small planets. Planets seem to either come uh, as uh, bare rocky cores or with massive atmospheres that roughly double the radius. Uh, the standard theory to have what happened to these intermediate atmospheres is that they uh, were photoevaporated. But I suggested that they were lost due to the cooling luminosity of the planet's own water core, which is, in my opinion, a much simpler and more natural uh, explanation. Now, how do you distinguish between the two? So I'm suggesting to exploit the biggest difference between the two theories. So uh, photoevaporation relies on the uh, high energy tail of the star's uh, luminosity only the ionizing photons. Whereas the core cooling correlates with the planet's equilibrium temperature and therefore with the barometric luminosity of the star. And the ratio between these two uh, is different between different stellar types. So I'm suggesting to plot uh, to see how the value looks like for different uh, stellar types. And actually, if I have more time, I have more time? Okay, so actually, I came and posted this paper from the archive from about two days ago, where people actually did this uh, distribution not only for sun-like stars, like uh, the Kepler sample, but also for M dwarfs. So I, I didn't, have, didn't have time to read the whole paper, I just saw this plot, and you can see that they also seem to have a gap in the radius distribution of M dwarfs. So if the gap looks the same, it might suggest that we're not talking here about photoevaporation, but on some other process that has nothing to do with the uh, high energy tail, because M dwarfs have a very different uh, UV activity than uh, sunlight stars during the early night. Uh, but uh, we should look this to see what it actually means. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ben, um, your, your work is very compelling, and, but it raises the question of why the cores always have roughly the size of the Earth. Ah, yes. Yeah, so, uh, you, you principally could have had core that is twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. So I think that for, uh, so for the cores, we have a better handle because we also have uh, the masses of some planets. Uh, and the mass distribution looks something like this. So, uh, so these are the observations. You can ignore the models. So you can see that cores don't have to be clustered around roughly uh, values of the Earth. You can have some distribution. So uh, the colored ones are the theoretical distributions which are used. And you can see that they do have some planets which are larger than, uh, than just being an elf. And this will give you exactly this, uh, this tail over here. So you, it doesn't have to be that fine-tuned. Uh, but it seems that there are more such uh, small planets. But you do have this quite significant thing. So you think the Earth might have had an atmosphere that lost? Oh, so the Earth is a bit more complicated because uh, we believe that these planets accreted their atmospheres while there was still a gas disk uh, to accrete gas form. While for the Earth, uh, we think that uh, it forms from smaller, uh, about I don't know, 20 or 50 uh, smaller mass objects uh, with collisions, and these collisions we believe that they happened uh, after these gases went away. So, uh, so I'm not sure it's part of the same story. It's a timing issue. Questions for Sivan? Convincing, otherwise you'll okay. hear criticism. So. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, that's right. Oh, there is a yeah. question. Um, can you explain a little bit more how you made this bottom histogram? Because like your few parameter model seems to be going through the data with that. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so when I said that I didn't tweak any parameters, I lied. Mm -hmm. I did tweak this tail over here. So from this tail, I did the, uh, so, so let me go. So the blue model, sorry. So for the red model, there was no tweaking and uh, no, uh, no mass loss. It didn't work. Here, we had the mass loss, but still no tweaking of the parameters. And yeah, surprisingly, we got the value pretty well. But we didn't get the tail very well. So we want to see what happens to the tail here. 
And then we found out that the uh, mass distribution that we were using, which we basically adopted from the previous table we tried to test photo evaporation, uh, we saw that the mass distribution doesn't fit the observations. It is an observed high mass tail. So we added a, a high mass tail until we tweaked the parameter. We tweaked, we tweaked the power law of how this tail declines uh, to get the observations here uh, right. But then we went back to the observations and we saw that uh, it's consistent with them. So yeah, so this part is uh, a bit of tweaking, but the value itself, it's just, yeah, we also surprised. No parameters. There we go. <clears throat> when you looked at the paper which allowed you to distinguish the two possible explanations, yeah. how carefully did you look at that plot and the uncertainties in that plot? So which paper are you referring to? The, the one here. Uh, Toronto at all 2007. Ah, okay. I, uh, I only looked at it for about uh, five minutes, so <laughs> that's why it's not part of the talk even. It's uh, after the... Sorry, I just saw this figure and I said, okay, I must uh, show you that because... Uh, so Just people are doing what the uncertainty. Yeah, so are. so I have no idea what the uncertainty. Well, uh, well, if it's counting planets, then that so it should be square root of right. n. Yeah. So that would be my guess. Yeah. yeah so uh, so it's not part of the talk. It's just. Uh, so I guess I had a related question, which is, you have more statistics in those great. great yeah, these ones are thousands of planets. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's solid. Yeah. So here. Yeah. So for this. Yeah, so I think it's over 2,000 planets because it's over 1,000 stars and some stars have more planets. Uh, and this is the estimate uncertainty uh, in the radius. Yeah. Uh, so this is a very good it's like plot. Yeah. Bunches, bunches of sigma, so between 5 and 10. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so this valley, uh, people noticed it before, but only after these guys uh, did this uh, spectroscopy, they could give you such a good plot. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So Thank you for inviting me here. So I'll just, uh, I'll just take one step back from what Sivan was talking about planets, and I'll take a step back and talk about the gas that is forming stars and forming planets, and this is the molecular gas in our galaxy, in different galaxies. And I'll take another step back towards the early universe. Uh, okay, that's a small step, but an important one. I think it's very interesting to talk today about the early universe because we are in an era where we have ALMA and JWST. With these uh, telescopes, we'll be able to actually probe and see the gas in galaxies, uh, high redshift galaxies, and even in, at the times of ionization and first galaxy assembly. So it is very timely to talk about it. And the way I will approach this question of what is the chemical structure of uh, such uh, molecular star forming gas is, uh, is through the metallicity. Because today we have the metallicity of uh, the solar metallicity more or less, uh, of course there's mass metallicity relation, different metallicities still. But as we go further and further back to the back in time, we expect the metallicity to drop at some point, well, because the universe was created with, uh, with this, uh, almost zero metallicity. Uh, from observational point of view, we see such evidence, for example, from Lyman alpha absorbers at high redshifts, which can have metallicities of uh, about 0.1%. And also in our galaxy, we have uh, low metallicity stars, which can have almost 10 to the minus 5 relative to solar metallicity. So the basic question I want to address in this talk is, well, what is the chemical properties? What are the chemical properties of such low metallicity uh, clouds in the early universe? And I think uh, the chemical properties are especially important because, well, first from an observational point of view, 
that's how we observe things, right? We, we use these transitions and we deduce temperatures, densities, and mass. For example, in our galaxy and the local galaxies, CO is always used to deduce the molecular gas of clouds. CO, is it still good at low metallicity? We don't know. Yeah. Spoiler, no. <laughs> and, and then, uh, from a theoretical point of view, um, the abundances of molecules of atoms uh, are important because they are the coolants of gas and then they affect the star formation and the masses of stars. The classical example is the transition from population 3 to population 2 stars. So the first stars, are they very massive, like 100 solar masses or maybe 10 solar masses? This is very active research and this depends on the, uh, on the cooling, not only, but also. So the scenario is, uh, is as follows. We have a molecular cloud, we have a cloud, it's irradiated by different kinds of radiation. Cosmic rays, X-rays, UV. The UV can penetrate partly inside, depending on the wavelengths, and also on metallicity, because the dust absorbs the UV, and when you decrease the metallicity, you decrease uh, the dust abundance and the absorption of the UV. However, you can still absorb part of the UV by H2 self-shielding, even if the metallicity is zero. And this is important because this allows you to form a molecular core even at very low metallicity or zero metallicity gas. So, and the cosmic rays and X-rays are important because they can penetrate inside and they actually drive the chemistry because when the temperature is low, you need something else to drive the chemistry and this is what the cosmic ray and X-ray uh, do. So I'll concentrate on these inner regions and the molecules inside them. So the way uh, we approach this question, so we use all these uh, chemical ingredients that I just uh, described, UV photodissociation, cosmic ray, X-ray, ionization, the absorption of UV by dust and by H2 self-shielding. And then we have a large chemical network of reactions that depend on temperature, the ionization rate, uh, density, metallicity, all these parameters. We formulate the rate equations, solve them as functions of time, and we approach a chemical equilibrium after the chemical time, and this gives us the species abundances of all the molecules of interest. So these are the interesting, the, the most important parameters, the metallicity relative to solar, uh, the cosmic ray ionization rate uh, density, re relative to density, because uh, the, the chemical uh, the chemical uh, reactions proportional to density square, where the uh, destruction with UV or X-rays proportional to density, so in the end it comes to this ratio of zeta over N or IUV over N, where UV is the intensity of UV and the temperature. So let's uh, look at some results. So let's start with H2 and CO. So before I sh show actually the CO, I'll just describe the parameter space, so I'll just show now uh, two of the parameters. This is metallicity in the x-axis, z over n, the ionization parameter, if you like, in the y-axis. Going from, very, from solar metallicity to subsolar, and this is uh, like a galactic value of z over n. You can consider higher or smaller uh, values, and here's the Milky Way. This line is the H1 to H2 transition line. Below this line, the gas is molecular. Above this line, the, ga the gas becomes atomic because of cosmic ray ion uh, dissociation of the molecules. So now we are CO in this picture. Now uh, the color, the color uh, coding is uh, the CO abundance. This is log scale from 10 to the minus 4 down to very low uh, CO abundances. So here's the Milky Way. For the Milky Way, the value is about 10 to the minus 4, meaning all the carbon is in CO, as we know. And that's why CO is very good to trace the molecular gas. Well, not just because of that, but also. Uh, this is okay. But now when we decrease the metallicity and go below about 0.1 or so, CO vanishes very quickly. And this is because we don't have the dust anymore to absorb the UV radiation. The UV radiation comes. Actually, it's quite interesting because the CO is shielded by H2. So it should not worry about the UV radiation. But the UV radiation destroys the molecules, 
that lead to the formation of CO. So CO formation is less efficient when the metallicity is low. So it's indirect destruction of CO by the UV. In any case, when you decrease the metallicity, CO vanishes. You don't have CO anymore, or it's very low. And it actually might be a very bad tracer of the molecular gas at low metallicities. So where you don't have CO, it's all carbon, uh, atomic carbon. So all this is atomic carbon. And actually, H2 might be much better traced by atomic carbon at low metallicities. If you're still interested, what is the dominant molecule? Yeah, atomic carbon is nice, but it's atomic. If you want to know what's the dominant molecule at low metallicity, if it's not CO, well, you don't see it in this spot, but I'll tell you. You can also look at the paper. Uh, we find that it's uh, generally OH, and if the temperature is a little bit higher, it's H2O. And H2O is a nice molecule. It's water. And we like water because we need water to live. Well, I prefer beer, but <laughs> OK. It doesn't matter. So uh, what's the story of water is an interesting story. Because if you ask, can we have uh, actually high abundances of water at low metallicities, uh, the first answer would be no. Because metallicity is low, you don't have oxygen. And moreover, not only you don't have much oxygen to form water, you don't have the dust. So you have the UV that destroys water. So low metallicity is very bad for water. On the other hand, there's an, another hand that the temperature might be higher at low metallicities. Because at low metallicities, you don't have that, higher, that uh, uh, cooling that you have at high metallicities. Again, the C and O that cools the gas. And the temperatures are typically higher. Now, why do we care about the temperatures? Because when the temperature is higher, you can have a much more efficient formation mechanism for H2O. This is the so-called neutral-neutral uh, formation sequence, which might perhaps compensate for the uh, destruction uh, by UV. So now the question is who wins, the temperature or the UV? So we perform the calculation of the H2O abundance as a function of these two parameters, temperature and UV. For very low metallicities, how low? Extremely low, 10 to the minus 3. Again, thinking about these early clouds at the epoch of reionization. And what we see that indeed, there's a temperature threshold about 200K or uh, 250K, depending on the UV to density ratio. And in this region, you can actually get quite high H2O uh, abundances. So here the black line for example, shows the 10 to the minus 9 value, which is what we see in our galaxy today at metallicity of 1. So at metallicity of 10 to the minus 3, you can have uh, H2O abundance similar to what we have in gas phase uh, clouds in our galaxy. So I'll just summarize with these three points. Uh, when we go to low metallicity, CO vanishes. The molecular gas may be better traced by atomic carbon. OH and H2O become more abundant. and dominant heavy molecules, and water might be abundant in warm uh, early universe clouds. Thank you. I should compliment all the speakers today because they all stood up uh, to the time limit. Some even finished early. So we, we actually have time. If you thought about the question, you want to ask any of them. That you should, you should, uh, go ahead. But I, want, I, I will answer only one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Eric. Uh, so, um, how do you how do you compute the, uh, the self shielding, the, the coupling between the self shielding and the level populations for H two? Do you have an approximation or a lot of computer time? No. So in this so in this in this study, we actually wanted to study a big parameter space. So we we took another uh, approach instead of yeah because you can't make this huge parameter space if you do it properly. So we just assume that we are now looking into the inner region. So uh, the column density you need to uphold to get the self-shielding at low metallicities is 10 to the 22 centimeters to the minus 2. If you have that column density of 10 to the minus 22, then you have self-shielding. So this is a zero D uh, calculation. We don't have all uh, the, one, the, the profiles of the H1 and H2 
we just look inside the regions that are already shielded. So if that's okay if the density is high enough, but if, if the metallicity is very low, then surely the density then depends upon the metallicity. Density required for the self shielding. So how do you deal with say you have very low metallicity and, and the CO vanishes because of that, that? That would seem to be in that regime, that intermediate regime. Where, where the coupling between the H2 and the CO and radiation and level population is, is still important. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I get your point right, but I, I'll say that, of course, you might be in a situation where you don't have the self-shielding, yeah. and then these calculations do not apply. So, and then you can ask, what are the necessary conditions to have, uh, to have the self-shielding? But these calculations are assuming that you do have the self-shielding, and then in the paper we discuss what do you need to have that, and sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. Yeah. yeah, the typical conditions are molecular cloud the kind of densities. Yeah. And scales. Yeah, well, if the density is lower, you, the, the size scales would be large, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. Erwin? I'm just wondering, when you say water may be abundant in the early universe clouds, well, of course, if the metallicity is low, you don't have much oxygen. Yeah, so you, you don't have, you, you don't, can't win that, of yeah. course. But what, what we did find that while uh, in solar metallicity or while uh, the oxygen can, while the oxygen may be in atomic phase or in, uh, for example, uh, when you go to lower metallicities and to higher temperatures, all the oxygen that is there might go into H2O. So of course you can't have more water than there is oxygen. Well. We, we can't do anything about that, but at least you can drive all the oxygen that there is into water molecules. Yeah, not like. yeah of course, <laughs> hydrogen there is always enough. Yes? At the end, you made a comparison to Milky Way water, or Milky Way with a water abundance of 10 to the minus 9, but I was confused as to where you're referring to. We, we know in the Milky Way, it's just like the clouds, most of the water in the ice phase, but yes. 10 to the 5 order, or, Five orders of magnitude more yeah, well, water there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, you got me, you got me, yeah. <laughs> Five orders of magnitude. Again, that's that's the same kind of the same comment. Yeah. So in, in of course I was comparing to the gas phase. Yeah. And uh, uh, of course that in the Milky Way you have the ices which uh, together gives you about ten to the minus four or so, which is much more. So you can't you can't compete with solar metallicity. Of course, you'll have less water at uh, low metallicity in the end. You, you can't compete with that because you don't have the oxygen. But uh, yeah, if you if you are interested only in the gas phase, then in uh, in the Milky Way it's about the same value, and this is because yeah, it's either in ice or in uh, atomic form, depending on the conditions. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't take the metallicity down and. Uh, and remain with high oxygen abundance. <laughs> you would get your PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments to the other speakers? We have very excellent talks today. Well, if not, that's all for today. Thank you for coming.
thought about it very much. The idea would be every faster to burst can go to last like 20 minutes. Uh, and like, there's not that many galaxies yeah. in the sky. Well, anyway, I will go. I just wanted to say great talk. Thanks. Yeah, we will talk later. All right. Yeah.